We haven't always been here, but the neighborhood has. Even before it was a neighborhood on Earth, this one has been here. It was here for those that would be lost on those cursed grounds, for those who would die long before their real life ever truly began, and for those who never really wanted to grow up. We come from different times and different lives, but one thing remains true of us all. We lived on the earthly realm of the neighborhood at some point in our lives, and died long before it was our time. We don't remember much about our time alive since the last member of our group joined us, but we certainly won't remember when the next spirit comes. However, here's what we do know. Rolf was the first to come here. Unlike most of us, he was born in far off lands and, even in the afterlife, hasn't lost the touch of his old world upbringing. He lived in the neighborhood before it was developed, the son of a shepherd. He and the rest of his family came to start a farm on the lands that would turn into the place we would all eventually reside in. He died in 1903. While tending to the family's animals, the bull broke loose from its pen. In Rolf's efforts to stop the beast, he was trampled to death. That's why, even though he brought many of his family's livestock with him in spirit, he chooses not to bring most of the cattle along. He continues to go about his farm's business on a daily basis but is more than happy to occasionally neglect his duties to play with the other children of the neighborhood. Johnny was always a lonely child. In fact, Rolf became his first human friend when he came to the cul-de-sac after his death. His parents moved into the grounds of Rolf's former farm not long after his death. With no other children around and no field work to take up his time as it did Rolf's, Johnny drew into his own mind to a great extent. From this, Plank was born. Together, they wandered about the countryside, climbing trees and getting into trouble. Sadly, this didn't last forever. Eventually, Johnny became bedridden with illness. In 1922, he died after a long battle with tuberculosis. He saw his imaginary friend, Plank, standing by him to his last breath. Even now, in the afterlife and without the countryside to play in, Johnny still wastes much of his time frolicking through the backyards and streets. Eddie was the next to come. He was born in New York City, but moved to the neighborhood in 1932, just as the Great Depression was hitting full swing. The neighborhood, while still different, was beginning to take form from fields of its past, as families moved in and split the lands that had once belonged to Rolf's family. Always a schemer, Eddie looked to do anything to bring some comfort to his very bare family life, even if it cost him the friendship of others. He died in 1939, after one of his grand plans to swindle the sap backfired. He drowned while trying to cross the local river after running away from angry kids that he tried to deceive. Even in the afterlife, he keeps chasing after the almighty dollar. Sarah and Ed came together not long after that. By the late 40s, the cul-de-sac had already nearly taken its final form as one of the pre-planned developments that became popular in a post-war era. As brother and sister, growing up in the chaos of World War II, they both had various ways of escaping their lives as children of a dead GI and a working mother. Sarah became enraged and controlling as she sought to make sure that everyone around her knew that she was in charge all in an attempt to copy her view of her often working mother. Ed, on the other hand, went about it a different way. He shut it out completely. In fact, he shut out nearly everyone and everything in the world, becoming what appeared to be a complete idiot. Ed chose instead to become completely involved in the monster movies and comic books that had begun to pop up after the war had ended. It wasn't too long after that, that in 1953, Ed and Sarah died in a car wreck as their mother was taking them to visit their grandparents. Naz came a time after the brother and sister. She was a flower child, born to a pair of hippies turned establishment in the late 60s. She was a naturally beautiful girl that always had her way with boys and men alike. She lived life on a whim and would often go about flirting and playing without any intentions. She died in possibly the most horrible way of any of the children in the neighborhood. 
in the summer of 79, a serial killer who had broken out of a local asylum had slipped into her house in the dead of night, raping and killing her along with her entire family. In the trauma of these events, she, in a way similar to Ed, shut out the world completely. She forgot her parents and siblings, which is why in the afterlife, she doesn't ever receive demands from the non-existent parents, unlike many of the others. This gives her much more time to lounge around and party as often as she does. It didn't take long before Ed, Double D, joined the rest of the neighborhood. He was the child of two highly controlling professionals in the age of greed that despite their constant absence, dominated his life. As such, Double D became quite a meek, shy, intellectual figure. Always the curious type, he loved to experiment when given the time from school and the constant chores of his parents. This would lead to an untimely demise in 1986, as a gas leak combined with a Bunsen burner from one of his experiments tore him and his house to pieces. Being the timid and subservient type, Double D continued to follow the written orders of his parents long after death. Kevin was the next to join the group. He was born on the day of Double D's death and is, in many ways, his polar opposite. Kevin came from a broken home and developed a bold personality. In his life, he was the angry cynic who took it out on many other children. His abusive father would rarely pay him any attention and ended up bringing about the end of his life as well. In a drunken rage, Kevin's father beat him after he attempted to stand up to the man. The boy died on his way to the hospital in the winter of 1999. His father spent the rest of his life in prison. In the afterlife, Kevin changed his perception to the opposite of what his life really was. With a distant father who would shower him with gifts, however, he continued to maintain his bullying, even in death. Jimmy was the last to come to the cul-de-sac. He died in 2000, not long after moving into the house that Kevin's father had once lived in. He had leukemia since he was barely old enough to walk. As such, he was always a sickly child and, due to his overprotective parents, never really got to be around other children. He lived his days out in a small bedroom, completely neglected by the outside world. Jimmy lingered for quite some time in a state of near death, but finally caved in to the suffering of his lifelong illness. The Kanker sisters are different from the other denizens of the cul-de-sac. They were never of the earthly plane of existence. Instead, they are the children of demons, not too dissimilar from the succubi of human lore. They seem to possess abilities impossible by the standards of the others, such as the ability to appear nearly anywhere instantly. They were sent from hell to torment the already tortured souls in the neighborhood. For unknown reasons, they are attracted to the Eds. It is speculated that they are the weakest willed members of the neighborhood and are seen as easy targets. Despite this, the Kanker sisters are universally loathed and often feared by everyone.